Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tracy Abel, Chief Operating Officer here at American College of Healthcare Sciences. Thank you for joining us today for our Beyond the Cap Conversations in Complementary Alternative Medicine Conference. And welcome to our session with Amanda Latin on Romotherapy Blending for Wellness. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, joining us today, we have the indispensable and amazing Andy Pearson running our go-to meeting today. For those of you joining us online, you may have noticed your line has been muted. We are recording today's session and we will be sharing the recording and the slides with everyone uh, as soon as they're ready next week. You'll also notice that you have a control panel at the right hand side of your screen. If you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to type your question in the questions box and we will have time at the end for questions. If you are joining us here on campus, um, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question at any time. Our presenter, Amanda Latin, will repeat the question for the benefit of our online attendees. And if you have any questions that require a little bit more information or a more detailed answer, you can go ahead and send your question to info at achs.edu and we'll facilitate you getting in touch with Amanda. Amanda Latin is the aromatherapy program chair and registered aromatherapist. Um, she's been a longtime faculty member here at ACHS and is really instrumental in um, the curriculum here at ACHS for our aromatherapy department. Amanda is going to be speaking today on aromatherapy blending for wellness, and she's also one of our expert lecturers for our Kona Aromatherapy Bootcamp coming up next month. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Amanda Latin. Thank you, Tracy. And uh, thank you guys for staying around for the whole day until we got to my lecture. I'm happy to be here. And welcome to everybody online listening as well. I think I may have some of my students from my courses uh, joining us today. So uh, my lecture today, we're going to be looking at creating therapeutic essential oil blends. And this probably is um, a question that I get asked about more than just about anything. Uh, from either active students or people who are getting ready to graduate or people who um, contact me even uh, for consultations about this. They say I have all these essential oils, but I'm not really sure how to make an essential oil blend. I don't feel very confident with it. And it's something that students navigate as well, because we usually study essential oils or herbs individually first in our Materia Medica studies. But then when we go to utilize them, it can be difficult to choose which essential oils or herbs to use for a particular situation or if you're creating a blend. So we're going to look at different strategies today. Uh, for creating therapeutic essential oil blends. So these are our goals today for this uh, class. We're going to discuss some steps involved in creating a therapeutic essential oil blend. We're going to discuss how to choose a functional focus for a therapeutic blend. So that's an important step. We're going to discuss how to pick which essential oils to use while balancing the following. We're going to need to balance therapeutic actions, aromas, our client preferences, and also safety. So all of those are important categories to take into consideration. We're going to discuss general bottling, labeling, skin patch testing, and instructions that should accompany a therapeutic essential oil blend. That right there could be its own lecture. So when I say general, that's what I mean. We're going to touch on it. And then we're going to uh, practice this process in class by following a case study example uh, through the lecture because it, it's nice to talk about theory, but sometimes it really hits home when we see it put in the context of an example. So before you begin to make a therapeutic essential oil blend, it's really important to understand the scope of practice for an aromatherapist. So essential oils are highly concentrated substances, which I'm sure you've all heard about quite a bit already today. And Inga shared with us the difference between an essential oil and the CO2 extract. Um, so they should be used with extreme care. Not everyone should be making aromatherapy blends for therapeutic purposes outside of personal use or for clients without proper training or education. So it's not really a guessing game. You really need to do your research uh, or go through training before you start uh, on a process like this. Um, the state and medical practice acts prohibit the practice of medicine without a license. So the way that you frame your goals for your blend is important for yourself or if you're working for a client. And unlicensed practitioners must not perform surgery or prescribe prescription drugs. So, uh, you know, if you're working as an aromatherapist, it's important to go over those kind of disclaimers and utilize the proper language as you're uh, explaining what a blend's purpose is for your client, et cetera. And always refer your client back to the primary care physician 
if necessary. Sorry, but that's an important piece because if we skip over it, if it's taken out of context, then um, that kind of shifts the, the whole discussion. So just as I was saying, when we study Materia Medica with essential oils, we find out that essential oil has a gamut of therapeutic actions. Does anyone have any, all of you, I recognize several of our students and graduates here, when you uh, look at a monograph for an essential oil herb, do you just see one or two or three therapeutic actions listed? No. I mean, that's really what makes um, working with botanicals so versatile and effective is that they do carry many different therapeutic actions, right? But then if you start looking up how many of them carry the therapeutic action of anti-inflammatory, right, we could get a pretty long list going. So if you say, I'm going to make an anti-inflammatory essential oil blend, how would you choose which of the 50 or 60 essential oils that have you know anti-inflammatory actions to use. So we find there are overlapping therapeutic actions. How do you choose which one to use in a therapeutic situation? Many times also, we will see how an individual essential oil will have the therapeutic profile we're looking for in a situation. So we're, we're looking at uh, what we wanna work with with a person or, or in a situation and one particular essential oil really comes to mind where like you can see how it has the, all the qualities that you're looking for to address that therapeutic situation. But when we design a blend of essential oils to use, we have opportunity to create synergistic and even additive actions to maybe better address the therapeutic goals. And that's what Doreen's talk was focused on is the benefit of creating synergistic actions, right? So you're not only getting, you're gonna maybe create something that's even more effective than just one of those essential oils on its own. In aromatherapy and in herbalism, essential oils are usually used in combinations to provide these synergistic actions or to support multiple aspects of a situation, right? So usually, how many times have you ever had someone come to you and they only have one, one thing? <laughs> and that one thing only has one aspect to it, right? That never happens, does it? There's usually a whole picture of what's happening with someone. And that's why we want to create blends. That's what herbal medicine is founded on as well. Because you're going to get a more um, effective outcome taking that type of approach. So I know you've already heard synergy today, but synergy is an interaction of individual components that when combined, create a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And there's a lot of different ways to measure this in research. It's actually pretty interesting to look at how do you measure what that synergistic action is and what part uh, of the combination is, is creating that synergy. With essential oils, we see synergy within the essential oil itself. So there's many constituents within each essential oil and they work synergistically together, okay? And in research, we'll see a comparison between a complete essential oil and one constituent of that essential oil to see how they perform the same therapeutic action. Sometimes the single constituent performs just as well as the whole essential oil. Most of the time we see a greater effect using the synergy of the whole oil. And this is the same. Then we also see synergy within essential oil combinations as well. So there's two, two levels of synergy going on. So you've decided to make an essential oil blend instead of using one essential oil. So there's several approaches that we can take uh, in that process. There's two really. One is you can just create a blend, blend instinctively. And some people like to work that way. So they just sit down, whatever intuitively uh, or creatively grabs them, they're gonna pull those essential oils and start making the essential uh, blend that way. And then you can decide what its functions or uses are after the fact. So that's one way to approach blending. The other approach is a systematic approach. And so you're going to decide ahead of time uh, what the goals and needs are for that blend and then go through a systematic process to design something that meets those goals and needs. Both can be useful. I've seen functional uh, blends come out of both processes, but when we're working for a therapeutic blend, using a systematic approach can be really beneficial. Are you guys still with me or is it too late in the day for talking about this? Keep no, going. okay. I, I'm not sure, I'm gonna read the blank stare. Read the blend. Okay, <laughs> you gotta wait till slide 35. <laughs> <laughs> so why a systematic approach can be valuable 
First, it gives us a clear focus for the blend and clear therapeutic goals for the blend. Now, I'm gonna give a caveat that I could, I could look at one essential oil blend and come up with five different therapeutic goals that it could be used for or focuses, okay? And that is, you know, that's inherent in this process, but when you're working with a particular situation, it's important to focus on the therapeutic goals for, for that situation. This gives you clear planning and construction of the blend and it gives you opportunity to create a safe and effective structured application use for the blend if everything's chosen with intention from the beginning. It also enables for clear assessment of the outcomes. So what happens if it doesn't do what you wanted it to do? If you didn't understand your reasoning behind what you created to begin with, it makes it even harder to edit it, to make changes, to interpret what the outcomes were and say, okay, this worked the way I thought it was going to, but this piece here I need to work with. So this enables the formulator to determine if and why any changes are needed. So here are some general steps for creating a therapeutic essential oil blend. First, you wanna thoroughly assess the situation. How can you decide what you're trying to achieve if you don't really assess it? And that part can sometimes get skipped over. You really need to look at the whole picture. Then determine the primary therapeutic goals for the blend that you're making. Then we want to map an outline for the essential oil blend. And I'm going to talk today about several, there's a lot of different ways that you could map that to make that type of outline. It really comes down to the practitioner and the style that works for them. So then I recommend choosing a group of essential oils that could be included. So you're going to make a list of the essential oils that you think could work for your essential oil blend. And then out of that list, that first list that you made, you're gonna choose essential oils to fill the roles and function in the outline that you created for the blend. Cross-reference those essential oil choices for safety, efficacy, and client preferences. And then follow the guidelines for bottling it, labeling it, and giving the right safe directions uh, for use. So that's kind of a general from beginning to end process. The part I didn't put in there is assess the outcomes, what happened after you used it. I mean, you kind of start over again, okay, I'm thoroughly assessing the situation, right? And then you decide, is this what I want to stick with or do I, do I need to take a different approach? So here is the case study example that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the lecture. MA is a 60-year-old postmenopausal female in good general health. She is currently not taking any medications. That makes it easy, but that's not usually the case. If they're taking medications, then that's part of what you're going to cross-reference for, is if any of the essential oils you chose are contraindicated for use with those medications. She owns and runs her own business and manages several employees. M.A. lives alone with her dog. M.A. gets regular exercise, biking to work, taking short hikes, walking her dog, and gardening. M.A. has been experiencing low back and hip muscle tension and pain for several months. Recently, she also began to having soreness in her right foot and ankle. She has seen her chiropractor for these issues with some relief. So she's already been seen by a healthcare provider. She's also been having feelings of anxiety and mental overwhelm while at work. Sometimes she has feelings of depression and loneliness at home leading to difficulty sleeping. So we see that there's not just, it's not just the hip and back and ankle. There's other components to her picture. She has consulted an herbalist and naturopathic doctor and takes herbs for constitutional support and stress management. MA requests a consultation for aromatherapy support. Yes, question. So uh, at the beginning, you noted that she wasn't taking any medications, but down at the end, you mentioned the herbs and, mm -hmm. I mean, would you so not I guess consider that really medication? Pharma, I guess I could say pharmaceutical medications to make that clearer, okay. but yes, okay. absolutely. Uh, herbal supplements are important to take note of. Okay, so this is the this is the case study that we're going to work with today to think how would we approach creating a therapeutic essential oil blend for this individual. So, in looking at listening to her story, is the focus here a physical issue? Is the focus here an emotional issue? Is the focus here a mental issue? Is it an energetic issue? Is it the type of aroma? Yes. Or is it several categories? 
Mm -hmm. Inga says physical, mostly. Physical, emotional, and mental. But are there components there where you could see focuses around? We have a low back and hip muscle tension and pain, and also in her foot and ankle, right? But she's also reporting having feelings of anxiety and mental overwhelm at work. And trouble sleeping. And feelings of depression and loneliness at home, which leads to trouble sleeping. So if you make a blend, we're going to talk about this, that only addresses the physical, or you say it only addresses the physical, does that really fit the entire therapeutic picture of what this person's requesting aromatherapy support for? Now, in some situations, you have to pick because some of what the client is going to be presenting with is not something that can be addressed effectively with aromatherapy support. But you can say, this is what I feel I can craft aromatherapy support for, and that's the therapeutic focus of that blend. Sometimes with a client like this, there may be multiple focuses that you need to address, and you need to pick how you're going to approach that. So for my example, we're going to work on several approaches, but certainly you could maybe pick one and start there you know, and, and build. So primary focuses for case study example. First, physical, relief of low back and hip muscle tension and pain, relief of soreness in right foot and ankle, and support sleep. We see a mental emotional focus here, relief of mental overwhelm and anxiety at work. And then what I called an emotional emotional focus, <laughs> That mental overwhelm is different than just your personal feelings and how you're feeling. Um, relief of feelings of depression and loneliness. So those are the three different focuses that I, I identified in that case study example. And this is actually, it's pulling from a real life example from someone who got a consultation from me. So this is, I'm not, I didn't make these blends that we're gonna talk about, but it's, it's a person that very much so has shown up in my office. So choosing primary therapeutic actions for blunt. So those were focuses, those were goals, but those are not therapeutic actions. Okay, a lot of times this is the step that I, that I really have to pull out of students. They say, I say, what is, what is a therapeutic action? They're gonna say, I'm gonna support sleep. But that's not a therapeutic action, is it? No, so we really need to identify which therapeutic actions we want to use to achieve the goals of our blend. So for physical day, the, the actions that I chose were an anti-inflammatory, analgesic, and antispasmodic therapeutic action picture. For a physical night, uh, I chose a sedative and calmative uh, therapeutic action focus. For the mental emotional day component, I chose an anti-anxiety and stimulant. Um, therapeutic action focus, and for the emotional, emotional night component, I chose an antidepressant therapeutic action. So do you see how that shifts it, this different language, right? But this is this you could research. This you could build an outline around, and it's going to be much more focused, and you'll be able to evaluate it. Any questions so far? Okay, so now we're on to the outline step of the blunt. And this is where you have a lot of a lot of options. And truth be told, another aromatherapist could have looked at that case study profile and given you a different focus list and a different therapeutic action list. And their approach may have worked just as well as mine. But what's important is that the, the person, the practitioner understands why they're doing what they're doing. <clears throat> so this helps you organizing, choosing which essential oils to include, because as you notice on that therapeutic action list, you guys are probably already thinking of a lot of different essential oils that have those therapeutic actions. Uh, it helps to make sure all the therapeutic actions are covered so you didn't skip over something. Helps track the types of synergies that are in the blends that you're making. And helps map a balanced, um, you can create a balanced aroma if that's relevant to what you're, the case that you're working on. So what are our different approaches for making an outline? We can use the therapeutic positions outline similar to herbalism. Is anyone familiar with that here? It's okay if you're not, I'm going to go over it, but just curious. I, Scott Stewart, our, our herbal medicine program chair is nodding his head. And if you didn't, I would have to talk to you afterwards. Uh, we can also 
create an outline around synergy based on functional group or therapeutic actions. You can create an outline that way. We can create an outline based on an aesthetic or an aroma approach. Or we can look at through different uh, traditional holistic lenses where we could look at five elements, we could look at the doshas, we could look at the four elements. So there's a lot of different ways that you could create an outline to work off of uh, to create your, your blend. So this is an example that I'm gonna to use today in our talk is a therapeutic positions approach. And this is used quite a bit in herbal formulating specifically in um, traditional Chinese medicine or, or Chinese herbalism. So we have, these are the different positions within the formula. Now I would like to clarify, I'm not saying that essential oils of a plant have the same therapeutic actions as the herb. I'm just talking about a way of designing a formula using the same therapeutic positions within the formula construct. So we can have a chief herb or essential oil, which is sometimes also called the king. We can have a supporting essential oil, which is also sometimes called the minister. We can have an assisting essential oil, which is called the assistant. And we can have a conducting or directing essential oil, which is also sometimes called the messenger. And sometimes you can have more than one essential oil and herb in these positions. So you might have two chief herbs or two supporting herbs or essential oils. So the chief, we're gonna say essential oil, but I used the same herb here. The chief essential oil will represent will represent the real goals or therapeutic actions of the blend. So that might be that essential oil where you're like, this I could see really, this essential oil fits the picture of what I'm trying to achieve uh, with this blend. Then my supporting essential oil supports the actions of the chief essential oil synergistically. So it's its backup. Then the assisting essential oil brings balance to the therapeutic actions of the chief and assisting, okay? So like for instance, that physical outline that I did for daytime, what did I say? It said anti-inflammatory analgesic and antispasmodic, right? So maybe my chief and supporting essential oils have anti-inflammatory and analgesic actions, and my assisting essential oil has the antispasmodic action. So it's gonna assist the, the main uh, therapeutic actions there. And then this is something that's not talked about very much at, or as much in aromatherapy, but we have a directing essential oil. And so this essential oil's actions, they're associated with the body system or org, organ where the blend is focused. And that's uh, referred to, to as tropism. And tropism is a biological phenomenon where growth or movement of a biological organism, usually it's talking about a plant, is in response to an external stimulus. So that's where you see the plant turn to face the sunlight that's coming from a particular direction or a tree that moves and grows around you know, a house or whatever that might be. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So this is a phenomenon, but we see this not only in herbalism and, and aromatherapy, but we also see this actually in pharmaceuticals because there's certain antibiotics that will work very well in the bladder, but nowhere else in the body. Okay, we'll see the same thing with lungs and, and things like that. So we can choose an essential oil that it has a directing action where we're gonna say we want there to be a focus with this body system or this particular organ. And that can be, depending on your approach, you could even look at a particular uh, chakra, you know, however it is that you're, you're choosing to focus. So that can be a component here in this type of outline. So we can create an outline based on the therapeutic profile or functional groups in essential oils. Now, when you work with the functional group theory, if you're familiar with that, it's important not to overgeneralize because there's always gonna be exceptions to that approach. You can certainly look at individual constituents if you want to, but again, it's important to keep in mind the synergy of the complete essential oil. So I like to use it as a pattern uh, looking for a pattern within an essential oil rather than making a blanketed statement that all constituents within a particular functional group carry the same therapeutic actions. It's more looking at qualities and patterns. So there's a few different ways that you can create synergy that way. We can combine several essential oils with similar therapeutic actions and similar functional groups or even overlapping constituents. Okay. 
We can combine several therapeutic, uh, several essential oils with similar therapeutic actions and different functional groups. So there's examples like an expectorant action, for instance, could come from a monoterpene like pinene. It could come from an oxide like 1,8-phenyl, or it could come from a phenol like thymol. Okay, so it's similar therapeutic actions but different functional group uh, constituents. Or we can combine several essential oils with different therapeutic actions and functional groups with that complement and support one another. And that's kind of like that example I was giving with anti-inflammatory analgesic and antispasmodic, where they are different constituent profiles, different therapeutic action profiles, but they complement one another. So those, those are different approaches that you can take to creating synergy within a blend. Any questions or did that make, did that make sense? I think we needed to do some calisthenics before I started talking. These are all different types of outlines. See, I want you guys to get the sense that there's no one right way to do this, all right? But if you don't understand why you did what you did, that's what makes it wrong. Because <laughs> 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 it's really difficult. You can learn from that. You can learn, that's what I was saying, you can learn from it. You're like, I don't know what I did here, but it worked. And you can go study it and figure out. But the skill comes in this way, okay, where I'm going to be able to control what I'm putting together and be able to evaluate it based on my understanding of what I did here. And it always pushes you. You're always going to learn more. You can create an outline based around a specific type of aroma and its associated psychological and emotional effects. And there are some fabulously gorgeous monographs on the essential oils from this type of approach. And it's really interesting because everybody's uh, experience with uh, olfaction, with aroma, is extremely unique. It's very subjective. It's very individual. Okay, and, and that's something to keep uh, in mind. But at the same time, and I can say this based on experience, you will begin to find patterns with how people interact in this and work with the different types of aromas. It's both. It's highly subjective and personal, and it's also a pattern that you can work with. You can take a holistic approach to balancing aroma profiles. You can take a fragrance note approach, like top, middle, and base note. Or uh, here I have the fragrance families outlined, the fresh, floral, citrus, or oriental uh, fragrance families. But even if you take this approach, it still needs to meet the therapeutic goals that you outlined in the beginning for the blend. And last but certainly not least, you can take, you can, if you are uh, familiar with, you know, Western herbalism concept of four elements, or I use the Chinese five element theory quite heavily in my work, or the Ayurvedic concept of the doshas, you can pull that into how you create an outline for your blend. But I really think it's important for you to understand that system if you're going to utilize it, because it becomes very ineffectual if you don't understand the system you're working with, but you build a blend around it. So that that's where you'll really see the practitioner's background come into play. You know, certainly you can experiment with it, but um, understanding the system itself is, is what makes it useful here. And this slide here is just kind of reinforcing what I just said. So, uh, you know, the method that you decide to use to reflect your background and training, it should be something that you understand what you're doing there because you need to understand the rationalization you used to create the blend. Are there any questions online? Yeah. Okay. We're just speeding right along here. Okay, so once the primary focuses and goals have been chosen and the outline created, then the process begins to choose the essential oils to fill that outline. So now I'm finally getting to my essential oil component. All those steps come first. Now the, the way that I recommend doing this is to write out a list of all the essential oils that you think are relevant to the blend and then narrow down the choices from there. And my students always haggle me when I say that because they're like, Professor Latin, that takes you a minute and a half to do. And it takes me an afternoon because I have to look up all the oils and I have to look up the research and I have to do all this. Because I'm like, well, you know, just, do, 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 you know, <laughs> what about this essential oil? But that's how I got there. I've made, I don't even know. 
I have lost count. I have have a whole file cabinet of blends that I have made for clients, you know, and it only comes with practice. It comes with repetition. It comes with note taking. That's how you get to, that's how you build up that skill. It doesn't, there's no way, there's no shortcut to that. And you have to begin to understand your own style as a practitioner too. You can study the theory, but then you really have to see how it comes through you in application and begin to understand your own work and how you relate to an essential oil or an herb um, is really important. So if writing out the list of essential oils takes you time, it's not time wasted. You're investing in your own skill set. So um, essential oils need to be chosen from a selection of essential oils a formulator has studied and experienced. So uh, if you want to study an essential oil, a new one, I recommend you do that on your own before you pull it into a therapeutic blend because uh, then you're not familiar with how it's going to behave. So it's, it makes it difficult to interpret the outcome. Uh, be sure uh, the chosen essential oils are appropriate and safe for the situation, right? So it really depends on um, how you're going to use the blend that you make will, will often guide which essential oils you think to include in it. Okay, I have seen some of the worst mistakes I've ever seen is where that was not taken into account and someone just used an essential oil that was wildly inappropriate for the application or the situation, even though it had the therapeutic actions that they were looking for. And I heard the stories and it hurts. <laughs> So this is this is another key stopping point. These are certainly top things to keep in mind, but they're not the only uh, application method. Dermal irritation and sensitization, whether it's going to be used in a bath or a steam, if it's going to be used for diffusion sprays or personal inhalers. You know, you got to think, you got to ask yourself, how is this going to be used? And that's going to guide that initial list of essential oils. All right, let's go through an example here. Blend, I would make three blends. Let's say I'm going to make three blends for this client to use just for the purposes of teaching. So blend number one would be a topical application for low back and hip muscle tension and pain and foot and ankle soreness. So let's say I'm going to make one topical application uh, for that. Let's say I'm going to make a personal inhaler for her to use during the daytime when she's having uh, anxiety and mental overwhelm. And then let's say I create a blend for her to use in her bedroom before she goes to bed at night as a diffuser blend. Like, let's just say that this is the approach that I took to meet, and then we're gonna meet those therapeutic uh, action goals that I uh, identified at the beginning. How does that sound to you guys? Good. Okay. Good yes. Why would you pick depression to deal with at night, not during the day? Um, more for the purposes of teaching here, just to give an example of how to choose an essential oil blend, but really any, any of the essential oils that end up in the personal inhaler blend are going to carry that therapeutic action too. I just was more uh, identifying it more for teaching purposes okay. here. Yeah. And truth be told, probably the, it would, that therapeutic action would end up in the topical application as well. but. I didn't highlight it as much, but certainly that would be there. Okay. Yeah. So when I wrote this lecture, this was literally the list that I wrote out just to, again, for teaching purposes to say, here's what my initial thoughts were um, just for, for demonstration purposes. And, you know, on a different day, maybe I wrote out different, a different list of essential oils, or like I said, if you talk to someone else, they might have a different list. It does, it's certainly not like this is the list. Um, it's just an example of going through the process I, I outlined there. So these were, this was the list that just came to me when I wrote the lecture off the top of my head. And then you can see that it's a range of essential oils. Some are floral, some are herbaceous, some are from wood, uh, some are citrus. Um, so it's a different, it's a range of, of essential oils here. And then let's let's go through a hypothetical outline for the, the first blend, so the topical application. And I'm going to use the outline type here of the therapeutic positions that we looked at. So the chief supporting, assisting, and conducting. So the chief 
essential oil that I chose was rosemary. And I chose it off of that list that I wrote out. Like I said, this blend could, you could use many different essential oils here. This is just for uh, purposes of, of demonstration. The therapeutic actions here that I highlighted were analgesic, anti-inflammatory, anti-neuralgic, and anti-rheumatic. So that pretty that fits that pattern of what she's experiencing. Supporting essential oil here reinforces the analgesic, the anti-inflammatory properties, and also has some rubefacient uh, supporting action. The assisting essential oil was geranium, which has an astringent quality, and astringent quality, um, it's kind of interesting to talk about in terms of essential oils is it's different than than astringent action that you might see with an herb but astringent action sometimes is called uh, in essential oils you'll see it referred to as a toning action which again is more of an herbal um, therapeutic action term but uh, astringent action is really interesting so when there's swelling when you think of swelling uh, what do you feel in something that's swollen tight, right? doesn't feel, it also makes it feel like there's not as much space. It's like constricted. An astringent action has, it, it opens space by tightening and toning. And so, so then if there's no room for movement, right, it's almost like it, it I don't want to, I don't want to equate it to reducing swelling because that's not accurate, but um, sometimes an astringent action can be helpful that way because it just helps create space which can uh, open up movement. And then anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-spasmodic and analgesic actions there from the geranium. And then the conducting essential oil that I chose here was ginger. Um, ginger also has a number of these same therapeutic actions, but ginger has a focus on the digestive, nervous system, and musculoskeletal systems. Um, actually, ginger herb, too, also has a focus on the bladder, and so that's, again, kind of uh, directing it down into that pelvic um, area. Any other questions? What do you guys think of that? So I'm trying to understand when you talk about uh, chief conductor assistant are those also relating back to how much of each of these you're putting in the blend like you would be using uh more rosemary than you would black pepper uh and then more black pepper than geranium etc cetera, et cetera. you can do it that way you can certainly do it that way um or sometimes maybe the there might be equal parts of the chief and supporting, you know, um, I wouldn't say that there's a set rule for that, mm -hmm. but yes, in a, in a general sense, I would say yes. Okay. Yes. So each one has their own specific um, area of assisting, but in the whole, they all assist each other. You really want to go for balance, mm -hmm. right? Um, when I when I smell a blend, I really don't want to be able to really pick out individual essential oils right out the gate. I really want to smell a synergy happening. So something we haven't touched on yet, but when you're blending, of course you want to choose, especially for something like this, I'm going to be focusing on the physical therapeutic actions that I want to achieve. But in my own personal approach, I like there to be a balance in aroma as well. And um, also, if I'm creating a blend, then I want I want the essential oils to balance each other out, right? What that looks like might be different for the per, different for who is ever blending. You know what that looks like, and what that looks like for the client is going to be individual too. You know, um, but yes, yeah, so I mean, we'll we'll all going to show you the formula that I wrote. We can discuss it. Okay, the second blend, uh, we can look at creating a personal inhaler. And here I chose a horizontal synergistic combination. So we're gonna have similar functional groups and, and actions. And I chose, sorry, there's a little fly here that keeps wanting to visit me, not just waving in general. <laughs> um, so do you guys know where this horizontal synergistic and vert, a vertical synergistic, do you know what that's in reference to? It's actually a business reference to horizontal uh, 
integration or horizontal mergers and vertical integration or vertical mergers? Have you guys heard that reference to business? Do I have any business majors in the house? Um, so a horizontal integration is a company, you know, increasing productions of goods or services at the same part in the supply chain. So they're increasing what they're doing more at that same point in the supply chain. And that's what this kind of functional group, uh, this kind of synergy is here where I'm having similar functional groups and similar therapeutic actions and I'm group, grouping them together. A vertical synergy or a vertical integration is where you are merging in other pieces of the supply chain and you're gonna own all of it. It's different, but it's all working together. And that's what a vertical synergy would be based around. So instead of buying steel to make the cars, I make my own steel to make my own cars, right? So that's a vertical synergy. More than I make paper and now I'm going to make more and more paper in different parts of the country, right? And so I'm gonna own all of that one part of the supply chain. That's where we get a monopoly kind of situation. So that's, this is actually a reference to that kind of integration and synergy. Side note, but kind of interesting to think about it that way when you're making when you're making the synergies. So I just chose for teaching purposes today as demonstration um, a functional group synergy here. Uh, so monoterpene ester and monoterpenol synergy essential oils, and I chose three of them. So bergamot is my first choice, and you see that it has the uh, therapeutic action profile that I want to see here. So a nerving or anxiolytic um, therapeutic action, antidepressants. See, it ended up here in the daytime blend, Inga, uh, and antispasmodic. And in the bergamot, the uh, we see uh, limonene is a monoterpene. We see um, uh, linolyl acetate as an ester and linalool as a monoterpenol. So that's just an example there of uh, the monoterpene ester monoterpenol synergy in that essential oil. Frankincense, now frankincense, there's a lot of different species of frankincense. They're all gonna have their own uh, constituent profile. I'm just using this one as an example here. So again, we would see a nerving uh, component, anxiolytic, antidepressant, expectorant action going on with the, the frankincense. And uh, frankincense has a pinene, a limonene as a monoterpene, a terpenyl acetate, borneal acetate, some, some have octyl acetate, which is a, uh, an interesting uh, ester. And then it also has uh, some linalool and some other smaller quantities of monoterpenols. And then essential oil number three is peppermint. Uh, which has a stimulating analgesic and antispasmodic action. And it has a tiny amount, a little bit of limonene in it. It has some menthol acetate as an ester and menthol as a monoterpenol. I can't say that before I wrote this slide, I necessarily had ever made this combination of essential oils, but I was just you, holding myself to the test of choosing essential oils that I had written down on my list when I made it, just you know, for demonstration purposes. But you can see how this blend, it demonstrates using um, a horizontal synergy here. It meets my therapeutic action goals, right? And we have a balance of aromas going on here. So this would be a, an example of how to use that type of outline uh, to make that blend. Any questions? See, I'm not handing out any samples because I have to be done on time. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> And then last but not least, here's a vertical synergy. So these are different functional groups with complementary therapeutic actions. And I actually am demonstrating two types of outlines here. I'm also gonna show a top, middle, and base note. So we're gonna have a vertical synergy and we're also gonna have top, middle, and base note. Uh, remember that each essential oil has its own top, middle, and base note. So if you did organoleptic testing with an essential oil, you would experience that over a period of time. But Essential oils are often usually classified as top, middle, and base notes when they're how they would function in a blend. Um, so it's kind of important to remember that it's not like your top note essential oil is only going to impact the top note of your blend. You will experience it throughout, but that's how you can help find a balance in types of aromas. Um, for anybody, I don't think we have anybody here that's not familiar. Do we have anyone here that's not familiar with the three perfumery notes? 
top middle. So the top note is our first impression. It moves very quickly. It's generally made out of the lightest constituents that you would find in an essential oil. And then our middle note um, is the heart of the fragrance. It lasts longer, but it's usually less characteristic of the essential oil. So it might smell different than what the top note usually is very characteristic of what you think of when you smell that essential oil. This produces the body of the blend. So that's really the heart of the blend. And then our base note, sometimes called a dry out note, um, may not even appear for an hour to two hours. And it, it really um, can last a long time and it gives strength to the fragrance of the blend. So some, some, some essential oils are really strong base note like spikenard. I've gotten spikenard on my fingers before and I can smell it like four or five days later. You know, even though I've showered and washed hands and everything, they, they really have a lot of staying power. So here's the, the blend that I wrote uh, for this example. So this would be the diffuser blend to use at nighttime. I chose a top note here of lemon. So this has a, a predominantly a monoterpene profile and it has anti-inflammatory, hypotensive, analgesic, and uh, hepatic um, therapeutic actions. The middle note I chose here is rum and chamomile. Again, these are off of my, my list that I wrote out has an ester profile, predominance of an ester profile, has sedative, antispasmodic, anti-inflammatory, and nerving therapeutic actions. And then I have two base notes. Uh, one is rose. Rose is a floral base note, has a monoterpenol profile, analgesic, nerving, antidepressant, hypotensive, anti-inflammatory. And then my second base note is atlas cedarwood with a sesquiterpene profile, anti-inflammatory, nerving, somewhat sedative, therapeutic action there. So you can see they all have a different focus, their uh, functional group wise, and they have complementary therapeutic actions. Some of them are overlapping, but really they complement one another. Also, when you're, when we look at these formulas, you have to keep in mind the aroma intensity. So like Roman chamomile has very high aroma intensity, right? So, and it also has it has strong therapeutic actions. You don't need much Roman chamomile essential oil to feel its effects, right? So I'm gonna probably use a small amount of that. But Atlas Cedarwood um, has very low aroma intensity. You would have to use a lot of it in your blend to really be aware of the aroma in it. So you have to keep in mind uh, the aroma strength as well to find balance in the um, top, middle, and base note. What do you guys think of this this combination? I like it. Oh, yeah. Inga? Uh, I just I have a question. Yes. I picked rose. Yes. And you know, I know rose is just a fantastic oil, but it's so expensive. So I would tend to pick something mm -hmm. cheaper just because to pass on that um, cost effectiveness to my clients. Yeah. So do you have any questions? So that was my thought. That's what I was thinking about on that. I could tell you had a comment. Um, well, again, I wrote this predominantly as a teaching example to right. show how to create a vertical synergy. You could use a different, there's always a different essential oil that I could put in there. If I really felt like Rose was going to speak to this client, then I might use it, you mm -hmm. know, because they've asked for aromatherapy consultation. So if I think that it's called for, you know, then I'll put it in there. If I don't, I could certainly not include it if cost and that when you're writing out your list one of the things that we teach in classes is what are inhibiting factors and cost can be an inhibiting factor especially if someone needs to use the blend more than a few times you know so Inga brings up an excellent point you know that could be something I could say I don't know I can't really rose is too expensive for something to diffuse every night what else could I put in there instead so maybe I substitute it for lavender Lavender has a monoterpenol profile, you know, maybe I go a different route, marjoram instead, something like that, where it has the therapeutic action profile I'm looking for, it has the, the functional group profile I'm looking for, and the cost is a fraction of, of the rose. So you could definitely go that way. Well, I only made the comment because you're asking what I was thinking. I knew. <laughs> I, I actually think it's a really reasonable comment. I hadn't really thought of it, but then as soon as you said that, I thought, you know, I, the last rose I bought was like a dollar ninety-two a drop. Mm -hmm. I figure out what it costs a drop. 
So and that's when I went, oh gosh. When I right. when I wrote these, I again I'm teach I'm using these for teaching purposes. I I held myself to my own my own. I wrote out a list and I said I'm going to show this process through me to saying what I'm saying to do. But this is part of it. What she just talked mm -hmm. about. You you write it out and you're like, okay, I would like to use that, but I can't. So what could I use instead? And that's that's absolutely part of the process. Or your client doesn't like rose. Believe it or not, rose is a very one of those aromas. People are love it or hate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have strong aroma associations with rose. I've had many people just, I can't, they, you know, they can't. So, you know, there's a lot of factors. They might not like lemon. I mean, you know, there's, there's things to consider. So the best way to balance all these factors <laughs> is in assessing it at each step of the formulation. So Inga showing that she's done this before. She, that's something she would think about. Also, I tell my students, don't type cast an essential oil. There's not just one, as I've talked about, there's not just one essential oil that can achieve what you're looking for. And that's where we get into trouble, where we think we have to use the same essential oil over and over and over again to achieve our therapeutic, uh, pro therapeutic action profile. That's where we start opening up to over exposure to an essential oil or over exposure to the same type of constituent. That's really the major risk in aromatherapy. Most, for the most part, when it's done properly, it's quite safe, actually. It's when it's overuse or overexposure to a particular essential oil or type of constituent too much over a period of time, you know, and we can get in that habit easily if we type what I call typecasting. Like this is, I see this therapeutic action, so I have to use this essential oil because it's the best one for that therapeutic action. And that's usually, there's usually more uh, essential oils to choose from to achieve that. Yes, question. Before you make this blend, do you kind of run each one of these by your client to smell so you can get the reaction in case they, I mean, you don't want to make it up ahead and then say, have them say, oh, I don't really hate that. Um, so discuss aroma preferences, both likes and dislikes with the intender, intended user of the blend. And that's important. Um, I've had clients that I've had for years and I'm pretty familiar with what they like or dislike or they're willing to be flexible, you know, and then, but I have clients that I've worked with where when we started, I mean, it was only two essential oils and that was it, you know, and we had to almost go through a healing process with their sense of smell to where they could be open to using other aromas because they got headaches really easily. They got emotional overwhelm very easily from working with the essential oils, all of that. It's, it's a, each situation is going to be different. There's not, um, each client's going to be different and each blend you make for that client will be a different process. So check for allergies or sensitivities, consider the safety profile of each essential oil in the blend relevant to the application method and the intended user of the blend. Um, so to follow up what she was asking about, I was saying after you've decided which essential oils you think you want to use, you can certainly go through and do organoleptic testing with your client and let them smell each essential oil individually. Um, I have found with some essential oils, though, like, for instance, the Roman chamomile that I use, it's really strong on its own. There's some people who really love its scent on its own, but most people don't. But if I use it in a blend, then they find it approachable. So, you, you know, you can consider things like that. So this allows the formulator to see the intended uh, user's reactions to the different essential oils in terms of likes and dislikes. And I keep chart notes on that, um, especially if there's a strong reaction. If your outline uh, focus is based on a particular aroma type, this can be a very important step. Um, also, you may have, okay, this is really gonna meet my therapeutic goals, but the person doesn't like any of the aromas that I've chosen. And that's why understanding your rationale for why you chose those essential oils is important because then you're gonna be able to come up with substitutes. Oh, you don't like that? Okay, well, we can use these oils instead. What do you think of these? Um, and that, that helps make that process a lot more smooth. I can't reinforce this enough, obviously. <laughs> Knowing essential oil you're gonna diffuse could be fine, using it in a bath could not be fine. You, you understand? So that is just so important to, to keep track of when you're blending. 
Here are some common safety cautions and contraindications. These are not the only ones, but these are co co common ones that you need to keep in mind. Dermal irritation from topical application, sensitization from frequency of use, photosization from topical use, allergy sensitivities. Uh, children, in general, you need to use more caution when working with them and lower dilution rates, smaller amounts. Um, you need to be aware of the cautions and contraindications for essential oils during pregnancy. Appropriate dilution rates in general, just for everybody. Uh, contraindications for specific constituents or functional group families, depending on a person's constitution, uh, conditions they may have, medications they may be taking, et cetera. Always do your research. I sometimes will do that. I will just check again, even though I look at this stuff every day, I will check again to see if there's anything new that has been published or anything that I need to, to be aware of. Or if I just, it's maybe I need to look at it again to refresh my memory. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, or if you're not sure, reach out to one of your colleagues and say, I'm not sure about this. Do you have any information on it? You know, it's better to double check ahead of time than something to happen and you regret not researching it. Um, I didn't put that on there, I don't think, but I really recommend skin patch testing too. Um, sometimes I will do it even if it's going to be a diffuser blend, I will make a diluted version of that blend and do a skin patch test just to see if the person has any uh, reaction to it because you really want to know that before they start using it frequently. So once you've gone through all of these steps, now it's time to write the final blend formula. Um, and you're going to find even with good planning, you might have to fiddle with it before you get it to turn out the way that you want it to. Um, so these are factors to consider aroma intensity of each essential oil, importance of the therapeutic goal relative to the aroma goal. So keep that balanced in mind. Um, proportions of each essential oil relative to safety concerns and therapeutic action role of each essential oil relative to the goals. So all of that will help you determine how much uh, proportion wise of each essential oil to use in your blend. So here's here's the blends that I wrote. And again, you could write it differently and it probably would still turn out to be a beautiful functional essential oil blend. So some of this just comes down to preference. So for the topical application blend, I used four parts of uh, rosemary essential oil, three parts each of the black pepper and geranium, and then one part of the ginger essential oil for that blend. Uh, for the personal inhaler blend, I used six parts bergamot, four parts frankincense, and one part peppermint. And then for the blend that we're gonna smell today, I, I used five parts of lemon, one part Roman chamomile, and two parts each of the rose and the cedar wood. You guys have that blend if you want to. Um, you want some tester strips? We're gonna make we're gonna make the um, the inhaler after the webinar is over. Okay, so oh, thank you. Maybe we can all just put a drop on um, a tester strip and uh, smell it together. Actually, Eva, I need one. Too. Oops. Okay. So this was already mixed with those proportions. Is there any comments from online? Do we have anyone online? Yeah. Keep watching. I guess you're explaining it earlier. Really <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys tell I've explained this before? <laughs> What do you guys think of that? <laughs> so you notice the chamomile is in the least, and you mm. still you, it's, it, you, you smell it. Yeah. And it smells more fruity mm -hmm. than I would think it would have smelled. Expected maybe a little bit. I don't know. Once it opens up a little bit, though. You start smelling the other notes in there. Mm -hmm. Yes. You inspired a question. Michelle is asking, when you talk about duration of use, is there a general rule of thumb to follow? Mm, I would have to say no. 
Um, but I, we do recommend, you know, depending on the essential oils, some essential oils is only meant to be used for a short period of time, like maybe a few days for a specific reason. I try to have my, my clients rotate their essential oils blend every few weeks. Um, and maybe that's something that we're working that's, that's chronic. And so I'm going to make them two, maybe two blends, one they use for two weeks and then another they use, you know, for two weeks and maybe we take a week off. But I can't say that there's a blanketed rule because it really does depend on the person. It depends on the essential oils. There's a lot of factors there to consider. Um, uh, but you do want to rotate. And something that I do is I work because I do work quite a bit with the five element theory. I, I change kind of my, what I'm pulling from seasonally, you know, so I'm just inherently shifting essential oils that I'm blending with. And so, uh, you know, that can help uh, re reduce the, the repetition factor. Yes. Another question coming from Danielle. She's asking, is it better to always use two different base notes in blends? No, you don't have to use two different base notes. And in some blends, you don't have a formal base note. You might just have a middle note um, that you use. Um, I like to include a base note in my blends because I feel it um, enhances the aroma of the other notes. It gives uh, more longevity to the aroma of the blend on the whole. And I generally feel like it helps round out my my therapeutic action profile and um, <clears throat> my constituent profile. So when you smell an aroma, you have a visceral experience of the aroma. Have, does anybody know what I'm talking about when you smell a visceral? So something you feel on the inside, it's a movement that you feel, maybe some people let more than others. But base notes tend to be heavier, rootier, earthier, or woody type of aromas. But obviously, the rose is a floral base note. It's a deep uh, a deep floral aroma. So, you know, you, if you pay, if that part is part of your work, you can pay attention to what kind of visceral movement you're creating with an aroma as well. It's interesting though, because I don't like rose. Like it's, so, it's such a great oil, but I don't, but I did, this doesn't bother me. Like it's usually, strong. usually I'm just like, nope. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, it blends well. It doesn't bother me. It's like, it usually does. Do you guys think this would be a, a approachable blend to diffuse at night? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you Absolutely. show us the therapeutic actions to this blend again? Or just tell us? Um, yes. I can either, I'm not sure. Andy, what's the easiest way for me to scroll back through slides? Um, just go to the opposite arrow. I guess we can back up here. This is like a daytime or a nighttime. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I, some people think lemon is very stimulating, but I, I found it to kind of be, go both directions myself. Um, I think that was it. Once we get that, we're going to make, uh, you guys are going to make a diffuse, uh, personal inhaler with this blend. Um, does anyone else have any questions for me Did that, about any of this? <laughs> Was this useful? I hope this was useful. Um, so, yes. Did you get what you needed off of this slide? Yes. Thank you. Uh huh. I'm just going to make sure that I covered everything here. So just some um, some more follow-up notes, you know, prepare the blend in an appropriate container applicator, label the blend with all ingredients and date of preparation. Make sure you do a skin patch test if necessary. Make sure you give detailed instructions for use. And I find it's important to write them down because people will easily forget what you said, what to do in the case of adverse reactions or potential types of adverse reactions. And, um, you know, include there a list of the ingredients and make sure that the person who's using this has a way to contact the formulator to ask questions. Okay, that was it. Thank you guys for staying all day to listen. Oh, thank you. See that we didn't get to do all three smelling because they wanted to make sure I didn't go over time. <laughs> but um, thank you guys for staying. Any no other questions online, Andy? Okay. Now, I'm sure, 
Have you guys made one of these before? No. No? I mean, Inga has. Yeah. So these are really nice because it's not plastic. Um, we're going to use these metal trays here as our dish. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to soak the uh, insert with the essential oil blend. And then the way it works is you, you push the insert almost completely into the glass vial, but not all the way. You want to leave a little bit sticking out. And um, then you screw this lid back on and it sits in the tube. And then when you take the cap off, you can inhale the essential oil. Um, we don't have tweezers, so you probably will end up getting essential oil on your fingers doing it this way. Um, but <clears throat> the easiest way is to drop the essential oil on the insert in the container, or if you're being very careful, which I don't usually do this without gloves on. You can also um, tap it onto the top of the cotton insert if you want. Is it coming out for you out of the little bottle there? If you tap it, it comes out. There. Yeah. Does it turn color or something? Yeah, you can, see, <laughs> you can see mine kind of turned a little yellow from the lemon essential oil. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. um, so. How much do you want us to saturate? Depends on how long you want to use the inhaler. If you only want to use it for a few days, then you don't need to put very much on there. You can save the rest of it to use for another purpose. If you want it to last uh, for a while, then you, you would saturate as much of the insert as you can. Cotton wick, kind of thing. Uh huh. Very absorbent. Very. Wow, that is like the least amount of questions I've ever had for a lecture. I don't know if that's just a good thing or not. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming all day today. I hope you had a good, a good time. Well, I think it's just been a lot of information. Yeah. Just absorbing it all. What's a, uh, a good book you would recommend to uh, maybe start with or to, to just read? Mm. For just the basics of what we discussed today. You know, probably a uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. There's a lot of different authors and a lot of different approaches. I don't know if I can could say this is the book One, to be um, uh, Laura Cantelli's book is out and uh, we have that here I think in the shop that's a good uh, that's a great book to start with um, very approachable solid information um, Salvatore Battaglia just put up a new edition of his book which is like a big reference text. Um, I like his writing style and he has uh, good information. Uh, of course, safety wise, uh, the, the Tisseron text is the, the staple guide for safety and that was another big reference text. Um, Jennifer Ryan yeah, Jennifer Ryan talks about some of the synergy approaches that I was talking about here um, at Jennifer Peace Ryan, she has, I think it's called Handbook of Essential Oils. And she has a blending text. She is a biochemist. Um, so she has a nice approach. Those are all, I mean, if you want to drop a few bills on aromatherapy reference text, those are all very useful. Absolutely. Typically, the, 
yeah. the way to get there. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer B. Swine, thank you for bringing her up. I was, I was thumbing through in my head. She's a great author. Cool. Cool. Well, you guys, hope you enjoy your inhaler. Thank you for coming.